and welcome. I'm Dave. Today we'll learn how to bring data into our application from the Postgres database we created, and we'll begin routing that data to our forms. I'll provide a link to all resources in the description. And I'll also provide a link to join my Discord server where you can discuss this Next.js full stack project with fellow students, ask questions, and help each other out. Hey guys, a big shout out and thank you to Sentry for making this full stack Next.js educational video series possible. Sentry is defining debuggability in full stack web applications, and I consider Sentry to be an essential part of my tech stack. From error reporting, logging, and tracking, to identifying performance issues with tracing, to user session replays, and much more, Sentry will help you write and ship code that delivers exceptional user experiences. Follow the Sentry links in the video description, or just visit Sentry.io and use the code Dave Gray to get three months of the Sentry team plan for free. In this Next.js full stack project series, I'm using the same tech stack that I've been working with on a major project at my job over the past year. For viewers, students, and subscribers that have asked what I work with on a daily basis, this is definitely the tutorial series to watch. I've got VS Code open and I have the user stories markdown file open. We're going to check off the goals we achieved in the last lesson and consider what we might achieve in this lesson. So I'm going to press Control B to hide the file tree so we can see the list a little bit better here inside of VS Code. Now, if you remember, I'm using an extension called Markdown Preview Enhanced. And if you're using that as well, you can press Control K and then the letter V to open up the Markdown file in a different format over here on the right. And that lets us check the boxes. So as I scroll here, we want to look for number nine, customers have an ID, full address, phone, email, and notes. When we set up our Postgres database, we achieve this. And of course, we'll continue to support this with the forms and how we work with the data throughout the application. Number 10, tickets have an ID, title, notes, created, and updated dates. We also achieved that by setting up the database. Tickets are either open or completed. So this is about a specific ticket field. And yes, we did add that as well. So we'll go ahead and check that. And then tickets are assigned to a specific employee. This is another specific field for tickets that we assigned and called it the tech field. So we'll go ahead and check that off. Now we are going to update some database data when it comes to this specific tech field when we go look at our NEON database once again. Now, before we move on, I want to say at the end of the last lesson, I mentioned we'd start working with React, Hook, Form, Zod, and Shad CN UI. And as I planned out this lesson, I really realized we need to take time to focus on the data access layer of the application. So we'll start working on some features, but the main thing is we're going to be pulling data into the application. So we won't really be achieving any specific goal in our list today, but we'll be working towards those goals. So we're going to use Drizzle to pull in the data we need from our Postgres database. And this takes place in the Next.js server components. That's our data access layer. And then we'll pass it to the client component forms for interactivity. Okay, I have logged into my neon.tech dashboard. We see the project dashboard here for the computer repair shop that we started in the last lesson. And I mentioned we need to update the tech field in a table. And I also just want to show you how an actual SQL query looks in the console here. So if we look at our tables, we have pull up here tickets and customers. We're going to be working with the tech field here in tickets, and you can see they all have the value of unassigned right now. But really, this is going to be an email of a tech. But if it's unassigned, we still want it to conform to the email format, so it's easier for us to validate. So we're just going to pick an example email like new-ticket at example.com that will be assigned before a tech has truly been assigned. And that way, our stakeholder will always know that it is truly unassigned when it just has that new dash ticket email as the example. Okay, to do that, we need to go to our console and that is the SQL editor here in Neon. So you can see it still remembered what we used last time when we inserted some of this data. So I'm going to press Control A just to select all of that and backspace to get rid of it because I wanna create a new query. So 
First, let me show you how a select query works. This is your typical query to read data. And some of you may already have worked with SQL before and some of you may have not. So start typing this out here. I'll just say select all from customers where, and now I can be specific, let's say the ID equals one. And if we run this, we should get the customer back that has an ID of one. So that lets us read specific data. We're going to want to do that, say when we'd want to edit a customer, pull that data into a form to view and edit that information. So that's one example. And of course, you could do the same thing here with tickets and you could search for a ticket by ID. So if we were to run that, here is ticket with ID of one. You can see it has a related customer ID. We could even be more specific. We could search for tickets and then we could say, where a customer ID equals something, and then we could also look for something else like completed or whatever other field we wanted to look for. So you, this is a very powerful language actually for searching for data. Right now, we want to update that ticket table. I'll click back on this temporarily here. Here's tickets, and we wanna update all of the records at once. We have 15, if I remember correctly. Yep, 15 tickets right now. They all have this unassigned value and we want to change those. So let's go back to our SQL editor and we can, instead of select, we'll use update. I like to make that capital. So update tickets set tech equal to new, what new, not net, new dash ticket at example.com. Now notice I haven't been specific with a where clause at all. So it's not just going to update the ticket with an ID of one or two, although I could be specific about that. This should update all of the tickets. So when you're working with data, you need to be careful because it would also be easy to make a mistake and update more than you actually wish to. But right now, let's go ahead and run this. And it said statement executed successfully. Okay, so now, Let's switch this, and we could just look at the table, but just since we're here, I'll just say select all from tickets. And let's go ahead and run this query. And now we can look over here at the field that has tech, and it's all new dash ticket at example.com. And we'll see the same if we look at the tables, look at the tickets, and if we scroll over here, you can see that value is now in for tech for all 15 of our tickets. So these have not been assigned a tech yet. We'll learn how to do that in a future lesson as well as we bring in that tech user data, the employees at the computer repair shop. But now we have updated this and you've also learned about select queries, but they look a little bit different when we create a select query with Drizzle. And that's what we need to do in our application. So let's go back to VS Code. Okay, we're back in VS Code. We have saved our changes to the user stories markdown file. Let's scroll up now and go to the lib directory. This is where I like to create my drizzle queries. Now inside the lib directory, I'm going to create another directory and I'm going to name it queries. So inside of the queries directory, I'll create a file for each query that I want to create with drizzle. This one's going to be called get customer. So as you might expect, this is going to get a specific customer, just like the query you saw that I executed inside of the Neon console, a select query. So first I need the database connection. So we're going to import db from at slash db. After that, I need to import the table that I'm going to query. So I'm going to import customers from our schema. So this comes from at slash db slash schema. And then after that, I need to import equals, and that is eq. This is something I'm going to use in the query, and this comes from drizzle-orm. Okay, now I can define the function. So I wanna export async function get customer. Now, this function needs to know which customer to search for. So we need to pass in the ID, which would be a number. Now inside of the function, I can define customer and set this equal to our query, which is awaited. So we start with await db.select. This is a select query. 
Now that has operators after it. And now this is a continuation. So I like to come down to another line, but it is dot notation here. So you could just have it on the same line. We'll say from customers. Now I'm going to go ahead and bring it down to another line like I like to and put each of these different parts of the statement on a separate line. So it's a select statement from the customer's table and then we have our where clause and this is where I use equals that we imported above and it's where the customer dot ID not index of dot ID equals the ID that we pass into the function as well. So this said customer here, let's see customers. We actually need customers ID. We need to name the table and it was getting confused with the customer we defined up here. So the customers dot ID is equal to the ID we pass in. Okay, so that's our query written with drizzle. Fairly easy to write those with drizzle. I really like how it works. Now after that, we need to return the data we get. So when we return customer, we need to be aware that this is going to be an array, although it would only have one result because we're only going to have one customer with this ID. So if we mouse over here and look at the type, you can see this at the end, it's an array type. So we have one object in an array. So what I really want to do is just return that very first object, the only object in the array, and then I won't have to worry about it being an array and handling that later. So I'm just going to get the customer object out of this get customer function. And now we also want to create a get ticket function. And they're so similar that I'm just going to click somewhere in this file and then use control A to select all, control C to copy, and now create another new file over here. I'll call this get ticket.ts. I'm going to paste in get customer. So we just need to change a couple of things. Our customers table needs to be ticket. So I'm going to control D to select all three instances of customers, change this to tickets. So now we've imported the tickets table from our schema and we've got the tickets table here in the from and the tickets.id, which is also correct, but we also need to change this, the word customer. We want this to be get ticket. So while we're doing that, I'm also going to control D again twice to change every instance of customer to the word ticket. So now I have an export async function get ticket that also receives an ID. And then we select from the tickets table where the tickets dot ID equals the ID that we passed in. Once again, we return the first element of the array, which is the ticket object that we want. And now with our drizzle queries created, we are ready to create some new routing. So let's scroll up here to the app directory inside of our RS directory, and then inside of customers first. Now we have the page.tsx file, but I wanna create a new route inside customers. So another new directory, and I'm just going to call this form. And then inside of form, we'll create another page.tsx. This is where we're going to request data. And of course, this is for the customer. So we want to import our get customer query that we just created from the lib. There it is. And after that, let's go ahead and start our function. So this is going to be export default async function. And this is something new with Next.js 15. I want this to be async because now the params and search params are promises that need to be awaited. That was not the case before Next.js 15. So we'll say customer form page. And now for props here, we're going to get search params is how I want to pass data to this form. And then after that, let's go ahead and define the type of search params. Now, if you look at the Next.js docs, it gives pretty much this type here. So we'll have params, and now with Next.js 15, it's a promise. And then inside of this promise, we have an object, and this has a key that is a string. And after that, it could be a string value. There's another type that's supported here that I'm not going to use, and that would be an array of strings, say for example, your search param had the same name and multiple values that would come in an array. 
but here I'm just going to use the other type that's possible, which is undefined if it's not provided. And then we can close that out. So that defines our search params type. So if we send it, it's going to be a string with a key that's a string. And if we don't send it, it's going to be undefined. Okay, now let's go ahead and complete, well, not complete the full function, but at least get it started. We're going to have a try catch here as well. So let's start that right away because we're going to request data right away. And after the try, of course, we have the catch, pass in an error. And then inside of the catch, we can check the error instance here to see if it is an instance of error as we're using TypeScript. Usually when I catch, I assume this is going to be an error, but here we can check specifically. And then if it is, of course, we can throw the error. Okay, with that, we have started everything out, but we're not really doing anything inside the try yet. So let's go ahead and add some information here. I want to start by getting the information that I expect to be passed as a param. So customer ID, and wait a minute, I actually need to destructure customer ID as it comes from the params. And now in Next.js 15, we need to await those search params. There's also params supported as if it was in the URL. So right now, when we get this URL, we would expect to see something like customers slash form slash, and then you could have your search param, customer ID equals and whatever the value is. But you could also have a route set up that would be like form. And then here you would have an ID. And if you had an ID in brackets, another directory over here, that would be a regular param instead of a search param. So Next.js does support both. We're using search params here. I'll get rid of that extra line. Now after the search params, let's go ahead and see if we got a value for it. So here we'll say this would be to edit a customer form because we're looking for a customer at this point. So we'll say if customer, there we go, customer ID has a value, then we can do something inside of this form and we'll find out, I guess let's request the customer and then we'll find out if that customer exists. So we'll say const customer equals, and now we can await our get customer query and pass in the customer ID. But notice the search params are always strings. So even when we get that ID as a search param, we're going to need to use something like parse int to turn it into a number because remember our query function here expects a number for customer ID. Okay, so now we've requested the customer, we're awaiting the result. So let's say if we do not have a customer, the customer doesn't exist for that ID, let's go ahead and return some information here. And I'm going to use a fragment so I can put a couple of things inside. I'm going to use an H2, I'll say class name, equals text dash 2xl margin bottom of two. So just a little bit of space, let's say customer ID number. And now let's pass in the customer ID value that we have. We'll say not found. Now I'm going to press Alt Z to wrap this down for you. Also control B for now, just to give a little more space. There we go. So we've said customer ID, and then we provide whatever number we search for was not found. So we're returning early here and essentially giving this message to the user that the customer they're searching for was not found. Now I'd like to put a back button here yet, but we haven't created that. So we'll do that in just a second as well. So after the not found, let's say it was found. So we have a customer ID and it was found. This is where we would say, put customer form component. So this is where we would edit a customer right here. We have found the customer ID and it's all good. But what about a new customer? Well, in this case, let's say a customer ID wasn't provided. So we could have an else right here. And now we could put in a new customer form component. And actually we're going to end up using the same form component for both. And I'll show you how to do that as well. But this gives us the two options. So 
was a customer ID passed to this form page that we're going to? And if it was, we're going to pull in that customer information and pass it to the form component so we can edit the customer information. But if a customer ID isn't passed and they go to this same form route, then we're going to have a form component setting up or creating a new customer. Now we're almost ready to preview this, try it out, throw an error, all of those things. But first, let's create the back button that I want to put here as well. And I want this to be a separate component for a couple of reasons. One, I could use it in more places in the application and we'll probably use it on our ticket page as well. But the other reason is it needs to be a client component. And this is a server component right now, our data layer where we're requesting things, getting a little bit of logic before we send it down to the client side component where we have the interactivity with the users. So in this layer specifically, a back button really just won't work on the server. We have to make the back button a client component because it works with the browser history. And the only way we can access that is on the browser as a client component. So back in the file tree now, I wanna come down to our components directory. There we go. Now inside the components directory, I'll just create a new file, call this backbutton.tsx. Here, this is going to be a client component. So we'll start out with use client. I'm going to import use router from, I don't want that to be from next router. We want that to be from next slash navigation. There we go. Then we're going to import button. And we got that from shadcn, which I believe we've already installed. So let's see at slash components slash UI slash button, there it is. Okay, and finally, we need to import button HTML attributes from React, there we go. And that lets us kind of extend our component down to the ShadCN button. So when we set up this type with props, we'll use that. So here we go, set up a title, is a string, Class name is optional, and that is also a string. Then we'll have a variant, and let's make that optional as well, because if we don't provide that to the Shad CN button, it goes ahead and, of course, applies the default. So here, this can be some specific things. Let's see if we can look at the Shad CN button component, find those variants listed out here. Here they are. So we had variant, default, destructive, outline, secondary, ghost, and link. Let's go back to the back button now so we can be specific when this is provided. Uh, default, it could also be so destructive. After that, I'm going to have, whoops, that is not a pipe. Let's put in the pipe operator, there we go. And we could have outline, and then we could have secondary. Then we're going to have ghost. Wrap this down again with Alt Z. After that, another pipe, and it could be a link. And then there's a couple of other values we could actually have null and undefined. So all of this just goes hand in hand with the Shad CN button. They're things we're just kind of passing through, but these are also things we want and the title is required is why I sp specified that right there. So now we'll also say and button HTML attributes. And this lets us not have to specify all of the other things that could go with a button as well. But if they're already built into an HTML button, we can still pass them in if we want to. Here we'll have HTML button element. There we go. So that defines our props for this back button. Now we can get started with the function. So export function back button. And here we'll have our title, our variant, class name, and spread in props, because then that could be anything else that relates to that HTML button. And let's break this down on another line as well. And here we'll just say props also. So here we'll have, whoops, not props, but props. There we go. Okay, now that we've started the function, let's go ahead and 
define router equals use router. We're going to use that, of course, to go back in the browser history. And now we'll have our return. And we're just returning a button with those props. So the variant is going to equal variant. Class name is going to equal class name. Then for an on click, let's go ahead and set this up. Now we've got an anonymous function in here. And inside of that, we want to call router dot back. And that essentially accesses the browser history and says whatever page you were on before, you can go back. And that's specifically why we needed to create this button as a client component. Okay, after that, the title attribute can also equal title, but it's also what we're going to put on the button. And we could have just said go back for a title on every button that's created with this back button, but maybe you want it to say something else. So we'll also put the title right there. And that is the complete back button component. So let's go back and import this now inside of our customer form page component where we're at customers form page.tsx. So at the top, import back button. There we go. Now let's come down here. Put our back button right there. It needs a title though. So I'm going to say title equals go back and you could provide a variant like default or one of the others as well like ghost or however you want it to look. So I'll just say variant default here and save. Now we're ready to go ahead and run the application, see how everything looks, see if our connection is working through Drizzle. I mean, we tested that out in the last lesson as we migrated our schema information to the database. So everything should be good, but let's just go ahead and make sure. And also we should probably log this data because we're not really doing anything with it, right? So if we request a customer ID, we should probably console log that or something like that. So let's go ahead and put a console log down here for customer just to confirm we did receive that customer information. Okay, control back tick to open up the console window now and we'll type npm run dev to go ahead and fire up the project. And notice we've got a couple of warnings here now that we've started the project. We're using Next.js 15.0.1 with the turbo pack now. And that makes everything a little bit faster. And I've really enjoyed that so far. But now we have unrecognized keys in object instrumentation hook. And that's because we put that in as experimental during our sentry setup previously, and we needed it. But now the instrumentation hook is no longer experimental. So let's go ahead and control C to stop this for now. And let's go down to our next JS config. Find that. There it is. Now they also support a next.config.ts file now, and we haven't gone over those changes yet, but we can take out this experimental instrumentation hook now because it is no longer experimental. It's just part of Next.js 15. So let's save this config file. Now let's go back once again and restart with npm run dev and see what other warnings we might get with things at this point. And it's worth noting, if you're watching this in the future, long after Next.js and React 19 are stable, you may not have any of these issues. If you have been following this along, you know I started this project as Next.js was still a release, or Next.js 15 was still a release candidate. So we've had a few growing changes here, just as Next.js 15 is now stable, React 19 is still a release candidate. Right now, we're getting a message that Webpack is configured while TurboPack is not may cause problems, we'll see. And if we need to change anything, we can reference that. But right now, I don't think it's going to. We're also getting a new warning here that I had not seen previously about using the Sentry SDK with Turbo, and it doesn't fully support Turbo Peck yet. So that's something to consider as well. So it says we could temporarily remove the Turbo flag while developing locally. 
and there's a link we can follow for that. I think everything we need to check is going to work okay, so let's go ahead and hold down Control and click localhost 3000 to start the project. And this, of course, should go to the home page, but we need to log in. So to do that, slash login, here we need to click sign in. And if you haven't signed in within the last 24 hours or the last week, I think we set it for the last week already. So now you would want to put in your email and then of course it's going to send a code. So I'll do mine with dave at davegray.codes. Now I'll check the email and get my code and I'll meet you back at the home page. Okay, I entered in my code and I am now at the home page of the application. Now we wanted to go to customers, but beyond that, and we could put a link here so it doesn't reload the app, but I'll go ahead and just type the URL in for now. So let's have customers slash form. And now this should default, of course, to the page that we created. Now we didn't put anything on the page. We're not uh, loading a client component and we didn't really put any elements or anything there yet. So what we need to do is go back and just check that console log. And so far we didn't request a customer though. So this would be for a new customer. So we don't see anything here other than just successful requests to customers form. So let's go back actually put a search param in here now for customer ID. So question mark, customer ID, you can see it wants to complete it with four. I'm going to put in two, for example. Now it looks like it completed just fine. We could have put in like a JSON stringify in an element, but we didn't yet. So let's go ahead and check our console. And yep, here is what we wanted to get. This is the customer information that we requested. So that console log worked just like we expected it to. And we are successfully querying our database with Drizzle and bringing it back into the data layer of our application before we pass it down to a component. Now, before we start creating a customer form, let's go ahead and create this same layer for the ticket form page here, our server component that will request the data. And at the same time, the ticket logic is just a little more complex because it also references the customer data. So we had customers form page. Now let's go to tickets and now let's create a directory here called form and inside of there we'll create page.tsx as well. Now I'm going to import get customer once again and after customer I am going to import get ticket and after that, I also need to import that same back button component that we created so we can reuse it inside of this component. Okay, there, now we can create the function export default async function ticket form page. Now this is going to receive the exact same type of params as our customers here. So we could just copy this because it'd be a little faster than typing. So here we go, replace that empty object with an object that has the search params. And now for the ticket form page body, and of course here we're going to have a try catch as well. So once again, try, down here we'll have a catch with the error. This could also be copied exactly from customers. So the catch will have the if instance of error and we will throw our error. Come back here and put that in place. And now we have two possible search params, right? We need customer information and ticket information, or at least one or the other. So let's say const, and we destructure here. So customer ID is a possible search param, but so is ticket ID. And this of course equals await search params. And now to save a little time, let's go back here where we had our back button in place. And if there was no customer, we were going to return a customer ID not found message. Let's copy this. We're going to change it just a little bit, but we can put that in place. I'll press Alt Z to wrap that information down. And now if no customer ID and no ticket ID, so we didn't get either param and we need at least one of those to know what we're doing on this page. So we're going to say something specific here. Let's say, Ticket ID or customer ID required to load ticket form. 
because any new ticket is going to have to start with a customer ID. That would be the first step. Who are you making the ticket for? Otherwise, we would be editing a ticket if the ticket ID was passed in. So essentially receiving a customer ID means we're creating a new ticket. Receiving a ticket ID means we're editing an existing ticket. So that means there's some more logic to add here as well. So let me scroll down now that we've checked. So we've at least received one param or the other. We can say this would be for a new ticket form. And here we would say if we have customer ID. So now we know this is for a new ticket. Now we need to define customer again. So const customer equals await get customer to parse int that customer ID that we received. And that would get us the customer just like we did in the previous component. And here, once again, we can say if we don't have a customer, so this could once again be copied right here. If we don't have a customer to handle that inside of the customer ID was received. So we received a customer ID, but no customer was found with that ID. So this is just like we had in the previous component. It says customer ID provides that param and says it's not found. Once again, it provides the back button. Now there's another check we should have as well. So now let's also look to say if we don't have an active customer. Now active is a Boolean in our database. So essentially if this is true, we're saying if it's false, we're flipping it to true with this exclamation mark. And now we'll say we can only create a ticket for an active customer. So very similar here. Let's return some information. I'll just copy this down and we can change a couple of things. So instead of the customer ID not found, we'll say customer ID number is not active. And now if we pass all of these checks, we are actually ready to return the ticket form. So this is where we would say a return ticket form. I'll just put that in as a placeholder. Here we could once again console log the customer that we expect to receive because we know we need that customer ID at a minimum for an active customer to create a new ticket. Okay, but what if a ticket ID was received? We can handle that next. So let's just come underneath this and let's say if ticket ID was received. Now let's do something with that instead. So we'll say const ticket equals await get ticket. And much like we did with the customer ID, we'll pass in the ticket ID so we can query the database for our ticket information. So now we know we're going to edit a ticket. So let's put a note here with that. So let's say edit ticket form right here. Now we can make similar checks essentially. So before where we said customer ID was not found, just come back up and kind of copy that. And here we'll say if no customer, and we give that information. So underneath this, we'll say, if no ticket, and we'll say the ticket number, ticket ID number, and this needs to be ticket ID is not found, and we'll provide a back button once again. Now, otherwise, we're going to assume, okay, we did find a ticket and we have that, but we still need the customer information as well. So we'll say const customer equals, now we will await get customer, and the ID we have is now from the ticket, because remember, we're storing the customer ID with the ticket. So it's ticket dot customer ID, and that is a number, so we don't need to use parse int on that. And now after we have this information, we want ticket information and customer information, we're ready to pass that down to the ticket form again. So here we would have return ticket form. So let's go ahead and console log the ticket. And let me give a space here, ticket. Now we'll do the same thing. I will control alt and the down arrow and we'll switch ticket to customer here. Whoa, I went too far. Okay, I come all the way back down. I want to select the first one and then the second one. There we go. And switch that to customer. So we could log both of those as we're ready to pass that down to the edit ticket form. 
Okay, let's open up a terminal to see if we left everything running. Looks like we did, so now let's go back to Chrome and check out our application. Back in Chrome, we're still at customer slash form, and of course we requested an ID of two, and that did exist, but what if we request something like ID of 42, and we know that doesn't exist in our database right now. Now we get the customer ID number 42 not found with the go back button as well. So we click that, and we go back to the page that requested customer ID equals two. So it goes back in the browser history. That's what we expected. Now we can check those similar things here with the tickets. And now that's slash form. And of course, let's try it out by not putting a param at all. And it says ticket ID or customer ID required to loan or load the ticket form. Okay, so now let's go ahead and put in a customer ID equal to 42, that's fine. Customer ID number 42 is not found, but what about number four? Yep, no problem there. Let's go back to our terminal and see if we got the information for customer number four. We sure did. So there's customer number four. By only providing the customer ID, remember the ticket route is going to think, okay, we wanna create a new ticket for this customer. And so that's why we've only got the customer information. Now, if we go back and put in a ticket ID instead, so let's switch the customer ID to ticket ID equals four. And now if we go back and see what we've got here, we should get, yes, we've got the ticket information for ticket four and ticket four is for customer ID two. So underneath that, we also log the customer. Here's customer ID two and the information we expected there. Okay, before finishing this lesson, I wanted to come back to this message we're receiving in the terminal. Now, again, if you're doing this tutorial in the future, everything may be stable with Next.js 15, React 19, and all of the different dependencies. But right now, we've just switched to Next.js 15 stable. React 19 is still a release candidate, and all of the dependencies, the different SDKs, are catching up. And Sentry doesn't yet fully support Turbo Pack, as they note here. I've followed the link and there is some discussion and I think they are working on it and I bet they support it very soon. But at the same time, we can just simply remove the Turbo flag or Turbo Pack flag, if you will, that is in the package JSON when we call our app into action in dev mode. And other than that, I think it will remove this warning that we have here as well if we do that. Right now, you can see when we start it, it says Turbo Pack out to the side. So I'm going to Control C to stop the app. And then we'll scroll down here to our package JSON just for now, of course. And I'm going to keep my eye on this topic. And as soon as they support Turbo Pack, we can switch back. But for now, I'm just going to remove the Turbo Pack flag from the dev script right here and save. And this will just go back to the way we were doing things before Turbo Pack. It will use Webpack and it has all of the configuration for that. And you saw in the message there, it did say Webpack was configured. So let me open the terminal back up here. It said Webpack is configured. Yep. So let me open this back up now. Go ahead and do npm run dev and we'll just make sure everything starts okay without that Turbo Pack flag. And yep, it's starting up, no warning here, no warning from Sentry, no other warning, everything's good. Instrumentation is working, even though remember we removed it from our next config as an experimental option because instrumentation is no longer experimental. Everything should be working. Now that we have this working, I want to apply Sentry in those try catches that we have in our customers and tickets route. Here we have this catch, and we're throwing the error after we catch it. So that will go up to our error boundary in Next.js, but it would be good to capture the exception right here or the error, if you will. So at the top of each of these files, we want to import and then an asterisk, which means all as sentry. This comes from at sentry slash Next.js. There we go. Now I can copy this line and we'll want to do this in the other route as well. So we're here in tickets, here is customers. Let me scroll up here. We'll also add it to the top there. Okay, now that we've made the change 
both of these files we've imported, we still need to use Sentry. So we'll scroll all the way back down to our catch. And now that we know we have an error, we want to use Sentry first and then throw the error and have that go bubble up, if you will, to the error boundary. So just before that, we're going to say Sentry dot capture exception, and we'll just pass that error in right there. And this is the same thing we'll do in the other file as well. So I'll copy this and let's move it over here to customers, scroll down and we'll put it right there. So if we have an error here in our server component, which that's what this is, even though we're returning a client component that is the back button, overall, this is our server component, this customer form page, and it gathers the data. It's our data access layer. It handles it and decides what we're going to send down to our form, put customer form component here or the new customer form component. Again, we're just going to have one customer form component that can handle both. The same with the ticket form. So we'll do that in the next lesson. So we're going to work a lot more with React hook form and a little bit more with Shad CN as we get into some custom components too. And of course, Zod along the way, as we'll want to validate that data in the form. And then again, when we get to server actions, we'll be validating data. So we'll be working with Zod quite a bit as well. A quick shout out to my patrons. Holy Coder is a progress provider. Sean Lynch is a senior patron. And my junior patrons, Programming Polyglot, Isaac, Will, Ernie, Stacy, Abe, Javier, Michael, Thank you all so very much. You're helping me reach my goals. Remember to keep striving for progress over perfection. And a little progress every day will go a very long way. Please give this video a like if it's helped you. And thank you for watching and subscribing. You're helping my channel grow. Have a great day. and Let's write more code together very soon.